Uh, good morning and welcome everyone to the 15th meeting of the Justice Committee in 2014. Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices completely as they interfere with the broadcasting system even when they're switched to silent? No apologies have been received. Item 1. A committee, I invite the committee to agree to consider item 4 and its work programme in private. Are we agreed? Okay. Thank you. Item 2. Support the legislation. Uh, it's consideration of one affirmative instrument, the Draft Judicial Pensions and Retirement Act 1993, part-time sheriff, stipendiary magistrate and justice of peace, order 2014. Now, welcome to the meeting, Rosanna Cunningham, Minister of Community Safety and Legal Affairs and Scottish Government officials, Jan Marshall, Deputy Director of Civil Law and Legal Systems Division, and Luke McBratney, Solicitor, Constitutional and Civil Law Branch. And Minister, you will be giving evidence uh, in advance of this instrument, and I understand you wish to make an opening statement. Thank you very I, I much. I do. Thank you, Convener. And it will be uh, fairly brief because this is not a uh, huge, long statutory instrument. The order is to provide for equal treatment in relation to retirement and the opportunity to work in retirement for part-time sheriffs, stipendiary magistrates and justices of the peace. It will make the same provision for these office holders as already exists for other judicial office holders. Uh, the order is not about a general increase in retirement age, which continues to be 70 across the whole of the judiciary. It is to provide equal treatment across salaried, permanent and fee-paid or non-paid members of the judiciary. If approved by the Parliament, the order will do two things. First, it will remove the current provisions that prevent part-time sheriffs, part-time stipendiary magistrates and justices of the peace from being reappointed if their five-year term of appointment ends while they are 69. This will address an anomaly in the current law, which effectively requires some part-time sheriffs, part-time stipendiary magistrates and JPs to retire at 69 rather than 70. Secondly, it will enable part-time sheriffs, stipendiary magistrates and JPs to sit after leaving office at the request of a sheriff principal. This will enable the courts to take advantage of the skills and experience of retired part-time sheriffs, stipendiary magistrates and JPs, where the business needs of the sheriffdom make this appropriate. It will also enable Scottish ministers in limited circumstances to authorise a continuation in office up until the age of 75. Um, that's a very brief overview of the order and its context, and uh, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions uh, as are my officials. Body, uh, good morning. Um, my question is perhaps not directly related to the statutory instrument, but to the just clarification to the government's position on the Phillips, uh, the O'Brien decision. Um, uh, 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 are the government still Can you just tell us what that is first? Well, it's, well, it's the decision on equal treatment for uh, okay. judges. The, the decision of Supreme Court uh, uh, said that the recorder in England was entitled to to be paid a pension in the same way as a full-time judge. Uh, yeah, what's the government's position on that in terms of uh, its impact on Scotland at the present time? Well, this order is the government's response right. to that. This, we, we saw that uh, um, uh, judgment um, and decided that uh, we would need to ensure that our systems were in line as well with that judgment. So, in a sense, the reason we're here is that judgment. Are we able to clarify what the impact on the public purse is of this change then? Um, there uh, uh, isn't uh, 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 um, expected to be uh, much of an effect. Our, our, uh, our view is that it will be cost neutral. And finally, does it have any kind of impact at all in terms of the proposals we're considering under the court reform? Um, the, there is uh, some uh, interplay, um, uh, I suppose, can be uh, seen. Um, Section 12 of the bill contains provision which will replace some amendments made by this order. So um, obviously we have to deal with it in uh, the bill. Um, uh, so when the, when the bill is brought into force, the re-employment of former part-time sheriffs will take place under section, 20, section 12 of the bill rather than the 1971 Act, which is what was their original founding uh, legislation. Um, the Office of Stipendiary Magistrate will be abolished by Section 118 of the bill, um, and the office holders will, unless they decline appointment, be reappointed as summary sheriffs. So, you know, we're dealing with a situation which is a historic uh, uh, situation uh, when the bill 
um, uh, or I suppose I ought to say if the bill becomes law, um, uh, then that law will make certain changes uh, to the historic situation. But we still need to address the anomaly at the moment because uh, the question is when that bill comes into force. Thank you. Elaine. Yes, <clears throat> my question is also about the overlap. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry. 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 Uh, add a supplementary to uh, Mr Campbell's question. He asked about the implications of the O'Brien judgment, and it does have wider implications beyond what we're doing in this instrument for fee-paid judiciary and the pension of, of fee-paid judiciary, and that will have financial implications for the government, but it's not relevant specifically to this, this instrument. Thank you. My, my, my question was a, a, on a similar line, I suppose, really, that... Uh, the Schedule 4 amended the 1993 Act, and now the Order now does that instead. And I wondered if there's any particular reason why the Order had to come in now. I mean, is there, it, would there have been a, a problem with some of this being left to the Act? Or is there some, a, a time frame um, that this needs to be implemented by that requires I, some I of those provisions to come in now? Technically, a kind of issue. Um, there's no immediate re requirement to do this, but the government's position is that it should be done as quickly as possible. That's why the bill on introduction contains equivalent provision, but that provision will no longer be needed because of some of the changes being made by this order. Right, it's more, it's just, I felt that there was a need to do this good government prior timing. to the... Yeah, we'll we'll the call it good government. <laughs> acting, acting timelessly. I'm just glad it doesn't apply to politicians. Um, John Pentland, you'll be glad too it doesn't apply to politicians. Right. Younger you are, Correct. yes. <laughs> Just very, very briefly, Minister, I, I noticed from the, the paper that it was an informal consultation that was carried out with the, uh, the Lord President's Office of Sheriffs and, and others who were involved here could ask the particular reason why it was informal and it wasn't a sort of public consultation where, you know, in general, we would be able to know what actually was said. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's in general terms, uh, uh, you know, if, if you're going to launch a full-scale public consultation, that's not, uh, uh, that's not a cost-neutral exercise, that does cost money. Um, there are some things which are so, uh, of such narrow uh, uh, interest and applicability that it's considered uh, uh, quite appropriate to, uh, to consult, but to do so not in the very formal uh, way that uh, uh, the other things are done and uh, as long as we ensure that all relevant stakeholders are spoken to informally then we feel that the consultation that is done by that method is as valid as putting it out to a public consultation when in actual fact in any public consultation on this the likelihood is it would be that same group of stakeholders that would that would respond. So it's difficult to see how this could be of much interest to anybody beyond that narrow circle of stakeholders. That's, I mean, occasionally informal consultations such as that do take place for that reason. Would a transcript or a, a report or anything be available for the, the um, general I'm not sure what, uh, what record is. There's not really, uh, not really any. I mean, the, the fact that it isn't a formal consultation means there isn't a formal uh, uh, output um, but uh, the process of undertaking the informal consultation ensures that all stakeholders are cited on this. Um, and the nature of this is such that it's highly unlikely that anybody's going to be opposing it. Um, uh, it's really, you know, the consultation is more, the form, informal consultation is more about advising people that we are uh, proceeding with it. Uh, and, the, you know, the smaller issues contained within that, that effectively, you know, that small group of people that are around that 69, 70-year-old uh, mark are the ones who themselves will be the most uh, will be the most concerned. I think John was perhaps asking, did any of any problems with it? Notwithstanding mm. it was informal, did any of these groups have any problems with this? No, no, no. no there's no, there's no, there's no. Um, there are no issues with it. I think, Camino, just to, to reinforce the point, the, the instrument um, is, uh, being, is being made in consequence of the O'Brien judgment, as Mr Campbell said, so uh, we're doing it as a, as a legal requirement. And what the, what the instrument does is to equalise uh, retirement ages across the whole of the judiciary. So we took soundings from, um, from those who, who have an interest in it. I understand that, convenient, but sometimes when you see, you know, informal consultation, it's like decisions get made behind closed doors. But I'm, I'm, I'm quite glad well, to accept this. He's accepting it. He's content. I, I think the difficulty is if you if you launch a formal consultation. I mean, that has 
That has cost implications, and it's difficult to see how anybody other than the people directly involved who've actually been informally consulted would be bothered to, to, uh, to respond. John, this point, which was right, but you're also content now, John, I take it. <laughs> you're very content. Very My goodness. Content. It must be the sunshine. Margaret. Yeah. Just to welcome the instrument minister, I think it does end some anom anomalies, uh, as you pointed out, it gives consistency and importantly at the age of 70 it does allow the re-employment uh, of some very talented people should it be necessary to uh, facilitate the disposal of court business. So I think this is an excellent instrument which we welcome. There we are. Um, so I'll now move on to item three. That ends the um, questions. And now move on to the formal debate uh, to approve the instrument considered on the previous item. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to remove motion S4M 9957 that the Justice Committee recommends that the draft Judicial Pensions and Retirement Act 1993 part time Sheriff Stipendiary Magistrate and Justice of the Peace Order 2014 be approved. Uh, Convener, you've inadvertently promoted me, and I wouldn't want that to <laughs> oh, stay on the record. Oh. <laughs> So, uh, in I'll, my, I'll put B to be confirmed. In, <laughs> in my capacity as Minister for Community Safety and Legal yes. Affairs, I move that the committee recommends that the Judicial Pensions and Retirement Act 1993 part-time sheriff, stipendiary magistrate and justice of the peace order 2014 be approved. Yes, and I hope I haven't in some way blighted your prospects there, <laughs> because a recommendation from me doesn't always help people. Uh, do any members wish to speak in the debate on the motion? No. Uh, could, the question is that motion S4M9957 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. And as members are aware, we're required to report on all affirmative instruments. So you're therefore content to delegate authority for me to sign off this report. Yes. Thank you very much. We now move into private session as previously agreed. Thank you, Minister. Thank you.